Hey listeners, welcome back to the Psychedelic Podcast by Third Wave, where we explore how psychedelics can be integrated into our cultural framework for the evolution of humanity. My name is Paul F. Austin, and today I am speaking with Dr. Holland, the longevity doctor. You know, I really believe that longevity is a mindset. You know, again, with the tie into psychedelics, I think everything starts at the nucleus of where your heart and mind are. And so when you actually get into alignment with that, everything else that you do for your body then follows naturally in suit. The good news about technology is it brings us far in advance into things. The bad news about technology is that maybe it disconnects us far from ourselves. What I hope to do is to teach people how to reconnect with themselves and use the power of their mind to help improve their physiology. Welcome to the Psychedelic Podcast by Third Wave. Audio Mycelium, connecting you to the luminaries and thought leaders of the psychedelic renaissance. We bring you illuminating conversations with scientists, therapists, entrepreneurs, coaches, doctors, and shamanic practitioners, exploring how we can best use psychedelic medicine to accelerate personal healing, peak performance, and collective transformation. Hey listeners, this is Paul Austin, founder and CEO at Third Wave. If you're interested in longevity, optimal living, and how psychedelics play a part in living to our fullest, you're in for a real treat today. I sat down with Dr. Holland Chen, a double board certified physician at the forefront of integrative medicine. This is another in-person interview that I got to record at the 2023 Wonderland Conference in Miami. And these in-person interviews are always so special because of the rapport and container that we are in. It just makes for a really special episode. So here's a little bit from Dr. Holland's bio. Dr. Holland Chen is a double board certified physician specializing in ways to help people heal faster and feel better. He's been featured on HBO, Forbes, and L, and is an expert in longevity, NAD+, stem cells, anti-aging, and non-surgical options for pain relief and repairing injuries. He's focused on peak performance, life extension, and optimizing wellness by reducing inflammation, boosting the immune system, and cellular detoxification by using regenerative medicine, biohacking, and natural supplements. He applies his unique techniques and specialized testing for patients to address sport injuries, pain management conditions, longevity optimization, and does all of this for high-performance clients. Dr. Holland attended the University of Miami's Honors Program in Medicine and graduated with Honors in Research Distinction. He is the author of numerous scientific publications and also specialized in interventional pain management from Albert Einstein College of Medicine's Fellowship Program in New York City. In our conversation today, Dr. Holland shares his transition from traditional to functional medicine, emphasizing the power of psychedelics and promoting mental health for longevity and for a growth mindset. We unpack NAD plus supplementation and its role in longevity and health. We explore the use of psychedelics and pain management and hear about Dr. Holland's personalized medicine program designed to optimize wellness and longevity through regenerative medicine and biohacking. We touch on the potential of AI in shaping personalized medicine and also discuss the use of peptides. Dr. Holland gives us a look into his protocols for heavy metal detoxing and shares his insightful take on extending health span versus simply more lifespan. As always, follow the link in the description for the full show notes, transcript, and everything that we mentioned today, and follow the Psychedelic Podcast wherever you listen so you never miss an episode. And finally, if you have just one moment, we'd love if you left the show either on Spotify or Apple, your honest review. It helps others find the podcast. And more than that, we appreciate getting to know what you think of these episodes and how these conversations are impacting your own journey in the world of psychedelics. All right, that's it for now. I hope you enjoy my conversation today with Dr. Holland. So we're sitting here at the Microdose Conference, uh, Wonderland put on by Microdose, and I'm sitting across from Dr. Holland. Uh, Dr. Holland is one of the world's foremost longevity doctors. He's been featured on uh, HBO, Forbes, uh, and many other mainstream media publications. And uh, I'm really excited to chat with you today about everything longevity and what that looks like. So thanks for joining us. Oh, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me here. So I just want to start with kind of an opener. What brought you to the conference here in Miami uh, today to speak about longevity and, and psychedelics? So, you know, it's very interesting because I have quite a few colleagues and friends who were here 
already presenting and then I got invited to present just because I knew so many people and then likewise I was able to bring in some of my community who are in the biohacking performance space so it just made sense you know I have a lot of roots in Miami I lived here for quite a while you know Miami has become a real hot spot lately because so many people have actually relocated here so we have clients here as uh, here as well so it just made a lot of sense to do this I love the concept of basically they pretty much put three platforms into one, you know, venue, right? It's psychedelics was the primary one, but they added longevity and mental health. And I really think those are the three hot topics these days in terms of what people are really looking for, what resonates, what's actually going on with people in terms of what they need for their health. So let's start, let's talk a little bit about your origin story or your backstory. So uh, you're a double board certified physician you have been running longevity and wellness clinics for 13 years now, from, from what I gather. You're also an entrepreneur in your own right. Um, and you, I mean, you look like you're about 25. So uh, in, a, in a good way, you have beautiful skin and you're young and you're vital, which I would expect being one of the world's foremost longevity doctors. So tell us a little bit about what drives you, what motivates you, what inspires you to, to do all the work that you've done? You know, when you go to med school, you have one vision of what your medical career will look like. And then as you go through it, you start realizing that the medical system is actually quite complex and even broken. You know, obviously there are life-saving procedures that can be done. The hospital has its place. But when you think about the general population as a whole, preventative medicine never really took that front and center stage. And it also is more, I would say, very generic and never really targeted things that were more on the performance side. And so my background is I'm a double board certified physician. My initial residency is in PMNR, which stands for physical medicine and rehabilitation. We saw all sorts of things from stroke and rehab and spinal cord injuries down to musculoskeletal issues, sports injuries. I then did a fellowship in interventional pain management over at Beth Israel in New York City. And that really... I would say shaped a large part of where I was practicing or what I decided to practice. And, you know, we were a very heavy interventional program. You know, we did a lot of complex pain procedures and things like that. Uh, there was obviously some positive aspects to it because you're very highly trained. But then the downside is what I saw in that ecosystem is that people were just getting a lot of opiates or pain medications, things that just were band-aid solutions. And then sometimes people just said, well, look, insurance says you have to do surgery on this person. So I became very frustrated with the way that medicine should be practiced versus what we're being told, especially from a perhaps less innovative standpoint. You know, the insurance says this or the healthcare system is so has so much red tape. So I would say my functional medicine journey actually began with my regenerative medicine journey. And that's basically things that help promote the body to heal. So I very much am all about how do we heal the underlying problem, not just covering the symptoms. And so the traditional medical system is very much disease management. It's more reactive versus functional medicine is proactive medicine. We're really trying to get ahead of the problem and really just help people heal. So I always like to say my big focus is root cause medicine and how do I get people off their medications or avoid surgeries? Let's talk about NAD+. Plus. Mm -hmm. Because this is something that you have talked a lot about. You focused quite a bit of your at least uh, public discussion on specific to cellular health. Mm -hmm. So I'd love if you could just let's start kind of with the basic foundations. What is NAD plus um, and why is it so beneficial for cellular health? And, and what does that mean for longevity generally? Sure. Absolutely. You know, NAD plus often referred to as just straight up NAD. It stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, and it's been very popular lately. Back when I was starting to use it way back in the days, many, many years ago, it was mostly a detox molecule. And that was because it was so effective at helping people get off of opiates, alcohol, benzos, all sorts of medications that essentially were in the realm of more addiction medicine. I was very curious about it because I had heard about how it could help somebody go from basically having serious complications and problems being dependent on, let's say, opiates, to back to normal. So I was very curious about doing research in that area. How could that help with basically regenerative medicine, things that help promote the body to heal, you know, stem cell technologies and things like that. So my journey really began on how to create peak performance in the body. And I was doing this almost really, really before a lot of people even 
hit the mainstream. When, when, when would that be? Almost 10 years ago. Okay. You know, it's a, it's a long time. And, you know, back then it really wasn't as popular as it is now because, you know, now we have a bunch of supplements and things like that. You know, most of my focus was on IV therapeutics. Mm -hmm. So it did require quite a bit of intervention in the terms of most IV NAD drips can take anywhere from two hours to three hours or longer. Kind of depending on your dose, right? And there's some like recovery time, right? Like it can be... Mm. Depends, right? Okay. Depends on what you're using it for, especially in the performance world. It's just uncomfortable during the infusion gotcha. to a degree if it goes too fast. You know, now there's so many ways that you can administer NAD, which is, you know, IVs. They have some subcutaneous injections. We have even patches. That was one of my ideas originally back oh, in the days. Yep. And then oral physically, we have the oral supplementation, which is not... I. I think they function differently. Oral supplementation is great. You can get an increase in intracellular NAD levels. I think the IV version does a little bit something different in terms of, you know, what it does for the performance of the body. At the end of the day, you know, what does NAD do? NAD is essentially a, it generates energy in your body, right? Your mitochondria, which are considered the powerhouse of your cells, use the NAD and convert it into ATP. ATP pretty much drives every cellular function. So when we think about DNA repair, uh, optimizing um, DNA function, your brain performance, your liver function, your kidney function, all our body requires NAD. That's actually why we see aging happen because when your body's low on NAD, your repair functions go down, the cellular functions go down, your body doesn't have the ability to keep up with the demand. And so that's kind of where a lot of the theory came behind supplementation. We just don't really store enough and produce enough. And so... Um, what is this relationship then between mitochondria health, you know, ATP production and longevity, living longer, uh, living healthier for longer? Why is it so important that we um, keep our mitochondria uh, healthy? So there is this very interesting, well, you'll see it online in many different formats. There's these nine hallmarks of aging. And one of the key ones is actually mitochondrial health. And so Identif they identified that in addition to things like gene regulation, protein folding, DNA. Mitochondria health is a huge one because essentially your, body's need your body needs batteries, right? Or your body needs energy in order to produce functions. And mitochondria is, because way back in the days, it wasn't as easy to study these things. Now we have a lot more technology actually to characterize sort of the function of what's happening. So I think it's actually going to be a real key therapeutic, probably hopefully one day in the pharma realm, right? where they can actually say, hey, look, this will help decrease mitochondrial dysfunction. This will help, let's say, delay the onset of Alzheimer's. I mean, obviously this is speculative, right? But I think it actually will go down that route because when your body has enough energy to heal or repair itself, essentially your function is better, your mood is better, your performance is better. So outside of NAD plus infusions, what are other, other practices, modalities, interventions that can mm -hmm. help to support mitochondrial yep. health? You know, I think what's interesting in the longevity space is a lot of us are saying very similar things. It really then comes down to the nuance. Diet and exercise has always been quoted as really- like 80% of it, right? Exactly, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you and sleep know, as well. Sleep and sleep is, sleep is sleep, so important. You know, and I think it's really coming down to like what happens to be, I wouldn't say it's more trendy, what I see now is sleep is actually really a hot topic, right? Whereas before everyone would say eight hours of sleep. So it's not like anything changed from like 20 years ago to now, everyone's still saying eight hours of sleep. I think because we can actually characterize sleep because we have things like Oura Ring or Whoop and you can actually measure the sleep performance, deep sleep, REM sleep, HRV. I think because we have this data, we have this feedback system, people are now more in tune with their sleep. I have a favorite saying, that I hear, you know, it's a pretty famous quote. It's like, you, you can't manage what you can't measure. And I- Peter Drucker. Yep, exactly. And so the fact that you can actually measure it means you're gonna have insight to manage it. And so when I think it comes to a lot of the longevity world, it's one thing to have some really key nuggets that are different, different. It's another thing to actually know how to implement it. And so I think that's where the key differential are, is gonna happen among what we see among providers. Because to let's assume most providers have a certain level of baseline knowledge, the real IP, the real know-how comes into, how do I sequence it for this person? How do I personalize this? If this person needs to have more NED levels, it's not just like go to the gym three times a week, eat organic and get eight, get eight hours of sleep. I mean, most people could probably read that. I always, I, one of the things that I teach about is the long, you know, the, the longevity mindset, right? And so that's basically saying there's a difference between knowing 
and believing. You may know something, but if you don't subconsciously believe it internally, you're not going to do it. And that's where I was starting to think about, oh, what's the role then of psychedelics? Because it's not only knowing and believing, but it's also what's the difference between uh, you know, the theory and the practice. Correct. In other words, I can know that, that exercise and, and, and diet and sleep and all these things, you know, cold plunging are important for me. But if I don't actually execute on them, integrate them in my day-to-day practice, right, then nothing's actually going to change. Correct. So with psychedelics and the impact that they have on neuroplasticity, and I think in a safe container, the way that they can sometimes help us to um, reprogram our subconscious uh, mind, it seems like that is a, it's an interesting um, catalyst for people to adopt healthier practices that help them to, to live longer. Right. You know, there's a saying like things don't change unless you change. And I think one of the things that psychedelics does that's so interesting is that it helps people change in a shorter time, right? I mean, people can go to years of therapy and I've encountered people who say they've had one psychedelic experience and it changed everything. And, you know, when you actually think about the quantitative amount of time, you know, that was spent, it's quite profound. And I, and again, it, it is a neurochemical balance, right? And so people who take antidepressants and things like that, you know, I think we can all safely assume that not everyone who's on antidepressants is actually feeling happy. They're just not as depressed. And I think that's why there's some, you know, there's some bite back where the people would say, I don't want to be on antidepressants anymore. Maybe I should consider something like a psychedelic because the antidepressant in some of the interesting studies say that they actually don't really work unless you're really just major depressive episodes. And so low grade depression or, you know, low grade anxiety, it's not going to be relieved by certain medications now. And whereas things with psychedelics, which is, again, still a quote unquote newer science in terms of the realm of what we're doing in terms of research and understanding the pathophysiology and the mechanisms, I think what we're seeing now is that people are much more open to understanding how does this work on a biochemical level? You know, I think I think psychedelics, we've seen a lot of clinical case studies, right? We've seen a lot of clinical efficacy now what's happening is in order to get that mass adoption, you know, do you run it through the phase one, two, three trials and have this very hard empirical data? And that's where I think the regulatory will help accelerate things. So you're a visionary. You started a longevity clinic in 2010. You were, you were well ahead of the curve when, when it comes to longevity. Um, uh, you know, psychedelics are sort of this next cutting edge technology. Where do you, where do you see the overlap between psychedelics and longevity and do you think psychedelics will become an integral part of longevity and wellness clinics as they become more legal accessible regulated yes i i believe that psychedelics it it will cover probably two to three phases of things you know in terms of mental health psychedelics obviously is very well known in that space to help with mental health so if you really actually look at one of these harvard studies it was an 85 year study so like eight decades of of basically following people, seeing what they're doing. And they said, what is the number one predictor essentially for health? And it was basically positive relationships. So when you think about all the things that they could have narrowed it down on, was it heart disease or, you know, liver dysfunction, GI problems, diet, you know, everything that could be medical. It was like, nope, positive relationships. So if you take that psychedelics creates a positive relationship with yourself, which therefore then you have more positive relationships with others, easily you could correlate and probably even do some research on the fact that psychedelics is a great longevity molecule because it enhances, you know, your own interconnected with yourself. You then show up for others better, right? Are there cellular physiological effects that could also promote longevity? Sure. In terms of like dementia, Parkinson, things like that, if psychedelics, it's one of the proposed mechanisms is increasing neurosynaptic transmissions or neuro, new neuron formation, that'd be good too. And then I talk a lot about this is, you know, in order to execute longevity in your own personal life, you know, I, I have this five H's of mindset, right? And it's basically, it stands for a few things like home, habits, hobbies, harmony, you know, et cetera. Uh, I really talk a lot about this because what I want people to understand is that, you know, mindset's not just about thinking positive. Your mindset actually does have a framework and it's hard because we're not taught how to have a positive mindset, right? There are things that we can do. There are certain affirmations that we can read about, but if you actually can have a framework towards it, I think in the realm of how psychedelics creates that essentially positive mindset for you, that's where I think a large part of the overlap is. So 
it's definitely 50 50 in terms of i think there's a physiological effect and psychological effect yeah and that growth mindset of really believing that i'm capable of changing right because so mm-hmm. oftentimes when people are in depressive states or they struggle with anxiety or you know they're they're they just feel stuck they feel like they're in a rut they feel like you know it's really hard to shift out of this and so it feels like psychedelics can be that catalyst yep um but i think they're not necessarily a thing to be doing all the time every day necessarily like even i I talk a lot about microdosing and Mm -hmm. sort of the the role of microdosing and i think it's great to start an initial protocol where you might do it two or three times a week for you know a month or two and the intention that you put behind it um i think has to be back to these lifestyle habits that we're talking about integrating better sleep more exercise better diet that's where uh, a lot of the tangible shifts happen in the the actual long term. Yeah. You know, again, it's just a resource tool, you know, and I think that's the big thing. The more something's accessible, the more re- we realize what this tool can do. Right. And and I I think that again back to regulatory, you know, when the regulatory opens up, which I think it probably will happen, right? We're already seeing it in some states like for example, Colorado, I think was one of the more pioneering uh, entry states where things became more legalized we're going to see a lot of shift in it. And I think also the research dollars will follow it. I love research. I think it's very important to back up any type of science with research. You know, you know, it doesn't have to be always big pharma sponsoring it, right? I think we're familiar with those type of studies. But I think if uh, clinics can get involved, some university centers can get involved, there's a lot of great ways to produce great literature, especially in this realm. And even back to, you know, you were talking about how a lot of what you initially focused on was pain management. Correct. Right. And what's interesting is they did some research a couple of years ago on microdoses of LSD Mm -hmm. and they found it to be just as effective at pain management as opioids. Yep. Right. So I think there's also some of these interesting elements about pain is can be psychosomatic. Oh yeah. And psychedelics can really help to relieve that. Uh, And that's not really been researched much, right? We hear a lot about depression and PTSD, but there's so much from a physiological perspective, Mm -hmm. whether it's chronic inflammation, whether it's pain management, whether it's things like shingles even, right? Like certain, um, uh, certain, what do you call it? Diseases, lifestyle diseases. Psychedelics are looking like, oh, they open up that capacity for us to feel like, again, this isn't a a life sentence, but I can actually do Mm -hmm. things to change how I am. Yeah, I think what's interesting if you, because some people might compare the psychedelic world to what was happening in the cannabis industry. I think the cannabis industry has more of a narrower scope in terms of, you know, what it can do. Now, it's by all means still very intriguing. They have probably different modalities. I think the fact that psychedelics does cross both that emotional state, right? And then also the physiological state of things. I think that makes it a very unique molecule. And because, you know, it's it's a totally different experience, right, than most medications, right? Now, you know, whether or not the hallucinating part is considered a positive thing or negative thing or that's all subjective, I think that's where it will even get more interesting is like, well, can those states help people feel better? Can those states help people get more insight? You know, because I think kind of back to the original question about we all know that diet and exercise is important. It's really going to come down to the nuance. And so I think when we talk about medicine, it, I'm really thinking about personalized medicine. And then the other aspect is, what are the nuances where it makes it different for you? Because we now know that you may want to be on a certain diet, but some people, it's not good for them to be on a, you know, pescatarian diet or vegan diet, and they might need to be more paleo. And that's okay. It's now coming down to what is specifically going to be good for you. And I want to talk a little bit about that because I think what's core to what you do is you are a concierge. Uh, medical doctor. So you really, you work with high level clients who come to you who are looking for a lot of support in that process. So just bring our audience a little bit through uh, what that process is like, what type of clients that you work with, who is reaching out to you, what process do you bring them through for this, you know, uh, transformation and longevity and health kind of bring us into the, the nitty gritty of that. Sure. You know, typically clients who find us, it's often by referral, you know, the client that usually wants to work with us, it's a year long program. And so we really bring them on a whole journey because if you really think about trying to fix somebody's health and optimizing it, it's a it's a year long journey because you're doing all the functional medicine testing from microbiome, heavy metals, hormones, environmental toxins, things like that. And then once you're there, you have to then optimize it. Now we do a few things that are regenerative medicine in nature. Obviously I love doing NAD. They usually come in once a month for that. So that's pretty much the process. You know, 
Sometimes some people have complex medical uh, cases. Those are evaluated case by case, you know, depending on whether or not we have the bandwidth. And then other clients that we see, especially, you know, when we get involved with certain podcasts or talks on stage, some people have more isolated incidences. You know, a lot of people know about my pain management background. So they may say, hey, I'd love to avoid a knee replacement or I have a failed lumbar back surgery. Is there a way to avoid having a further operation? You know, those are the type of cases which I call more regenerative. You're actually just trying to fix an isolated problem. But our overall thing that we really see is how do we create a customized longevity program for you so that over the next 12 months, we bring you on a journey and basically fix, you know, a good majority of your problems or even optimize your health. You know, most people I say have one thing they want to fix and it might be even just sleep. But if you're not sleeping, that's like one of the number one biohacks that can increase your health. Your brain basically dumps all the toxins during deep sleep. There's so much repair that happens in sleep. Your hormones and level, you know, levels like that are affected about your circadian rhythm in sleep. So even sleep alone is pretty complex as a science. And you know, now we're finally acknowledging it as something that we can measure and we can take action on. So that would be the majority of what we see in terms of like fixing people's you know, health concerns. And would you say sleep is maybe the most common kind of one thing to fix? No, I mean, it's yeah. many things. I would say the, the, a big common thing is gut dysfunction, GI, leaky gut. You know, sleep just, sleep just always happens to be a byproduct of people having inflammation, you know. I would say that energy levels, you know, I'm very focused on how to help people have more energy, think more clearly, feel stronger. I would say that's our big thing that we focus on. You know, I have a book coming out. It's going to be actually quite interesting in terms of- First book? Yeah, it'll be my first book. You know, basically taking all the 10 years of experience, a lot of the research that we've done, what we see in the clinical side of things, put it into a nice, basically user manual for people to read, understand more about their health, how to have more energy, feel more vital, know what to do in terms of things of like, what could they be anticipating? And so we have a few things that we really want to expand on. I'll be introducing the concept of, again, the long, you know, the longevity mindset. We talk about the five H's. We talk about the four horsemen that take away your mindset. We talk about the- What are those four horsemen? Oh, so, the, so the four horsemen basically is, you know, chaos, right? You don't have structure. There's things also like being detached. You know, we have a thing called harmony and if you're, if you're detached from it, you know? And so we, we basically- let people know if you're not in alignment with your five H's, there's a counter horseman that basically uh, goes against it. So obviously if there's a way to show some of the graphic, we actually did keynote on this uh, today, uh, yesterday at the conference, we can kind of share some of that content as well, you know, and I think this is some of the stuff that we'll be doing master classes on because at the end of the day, you know, I think it's super helpful for people to essentially take care of their own health. You know, I think it's great to see a functional regenerative medicine doctor like myself, but I think ultimately there are millions and millions of people out there who are really interested in their health. They want to be proactive about it. I'm all about just empowering people with tools. You know, I, I'm really big that internet, you know, with the, with internet being what it is now in terms of post COVID, everyone's so used to e-learning. And so we're really, we're really focused now on a lot of the e-learning modules for people to sign up for. Well, that was going to be my next question. Before we went, we went live, we were talking a little bit about Brian Johnson, who invests $2 million a year in his own health and wellness. I imagine to work with you for a full 12 months as a personalized concierge doctor is not inexpensive by any stretch of the imagination, right? And yet, writing a book, creating courses uh, makes a lot of this information uh, much more accessible and available. Um, and with how free education is today, right, whether it's podcasts or books or online courses or whatever it is, it's slowly happening. And so the, the, the sort of question that I have for you is when do you think, you know, personalized medicine, although in our, our circles, it's, it's been talked about for, for years, we wear aura rings, we do blood work. Um, we have a sense of what intuitively we need. When do you think this will become more commonplace, more mainstream? Where do you, when and where do you see that sort of phase shift happening? Is it this decade? Is it 10 years from now, 15 years from now? What, what should we right. be looking out for? I mean, I think the next three to five years will be very key. I mean, if you really think about what happened even five years ago, the landscape's not even remotely close to this. You know, I, I think in terms of timelines, three to five years is we're going to see a lot of what I call self-care. People will be empowered with knowledge. You know, there'll be more doctors like myself who are producing content or even, you know what, I always love to interview other doctors to find out what they're really good at. I think what we'll see is everything getting very super niche 
we're going to see doctors getting ultra specialized. And I think AI will actually play a major role in that because I think with the advent of AI, I mean, all these even chat GPT, open AI models, they're already in multi-generations and it's been less than a year, you know, so it evolves very quickly. I mean, will the doctor ever be replaced by AI? I don't think so, but I think the quality of access will become more uniform because AI will now be a great support tool. I think in 10 years, AI will be a really incredible thing for medicine. It can be scary, no doubt. I think even amongst the other worlds of who are not in medical, AI can have potential problems. And that's where I think people are trying to figure out where, where do the safety standards go? How does it influence the learning mod, you know, models? But I think, I think we're in an era now it is a thing to actually want to take care of your health. It is a thing to actually be mindful of your bedtime and eating right because our world is growing so rapidly, even with quote unquote organic food, the nutrient density is not there. You know, the soil is so depleted. Soil is depleted. Point, yeah. You know, I gave a talk, you know, the other day I was showing my heavy metal levels. I had super high arsenic and heavy and mercury levels, right? You personally. Yeah, me personally, yeah. I'm always sharing stuff of what I do. Like, you know, I was doing some biological aid testing and I was showing like, well, here's my physiological age versus my chronological age. What are they? So, you know, chronologically, I'm 43 now, right? But biologically, I was under 30. So I had over a 12 plus year gap, which is great. So that means internally, my body is doing really well. Externally, well, obviously externally, I, I can't change the date I was born, you know. Well, you look great. Still. Oh, you, thanks. you look like your biological age. So basically, you know? yeah. Well, I mean, and look, if I can be in my 20s forever, that's a that's a compliment, pretty right? pretty cool, right? You know, and I always say the, the cool thing about longevity is that you'll live a long time. You know, the hard thing about it is that sometimes it takes a long time to prove that you're right, you know. But if I can look like this till I'm 50 and 60, then people will say, oh, yeah. You know, back in 2023 when he was talking about this, it really made sense. And so, you know, I, I think that's where the science now is really catching up to being clinically implemented in terms of like, the science is always there. I think it's really more so people are open to exploring these things, you know, like NAD, you know, five years ago, it's like not that many people, I wouldn't say not that many people knew about it, but like now when I did a survey of the audience, like 80% of the people in the audience knew about NAD. And that's great, right? Because five years ago, you kind of had to explain it and whatnot. And, you know, it just shows the the shift in the consciousness uh, of where people's health is. Peptides. What are your thoughts on peptides and the utility of those? Yeah, I think peptides are great. You know, I, there's obviously some regulatory stuff happening right now. I think a large part of that came because of the whole semiglutide and a lot of the GLP-1, you know, peptides in the market to help people lose weight. You know, I think... You know, biohacking is meant to be an adjunct, in my opinion. It's not meant to take too much of a shortcut. That implies a shortcut, right? I think that's important. But like, for example, with let's take like semaglutide. There are people who probably shouldn't have been on it and they just wanted to lose a little extra weight. That's diet and exercise. I mean, so I, I would say there's some aspects where I, I really do believe in true and tried methods. Like peptides, I think, straddle that 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 gray zone, right? You know? Not that because I think they're bad, but I think some people might overuse peptides when they could actually just do something else. Now, to some degree, if you're trying to recover because you're working really hard, you're trained really hard, and you need that extra boost to help your body produce, let's say, more growth hormone, testosterone, et cetera, I'm not against it. You know, I, I would say peptides, that's not an area that I focus on. I focus on different aspects of functional medicine, regenerative medicine. But I definitely respect the area of peptides, and I know that there's a lot of people who really enjoy it, and I think there's great clinical efficacy. And I, I think just in the last few weeks, the FDA is really cracking down. Yeah, they really peptides. did. You know, you know, for whatever reason that it became on their radar. You know, I think, I think with those MPEC and the semiglutide. Yeah, right, exactly. Like, you know, and I get it because I think there were probably compound pharmacies making versions of it, copies of it, and obviously. That's not always great for big pharma. They want them to only have their version. So fine, I respect that. And I think because of that, and then the FDA then said, hey, look, uh, well, what else is being done? That might not always be the best way to do it. Now, who knows? I mean, I think there's many sides to that debate. That's kind of why, you know, to some degree, I didn't choose to really focus on peptides. And I really focus on more like the things like NAD, obviously, you know, many things that we do from a functional medicine standpoint. I'm a very big believer of detoxing your body. So heavy metal detoxing, environmental detox, because that alone can achieve so many effects that peptides, you know, may not be able to do on its own, right? 
I had high mercury and arsenic levels, like I was mentioning. You know, Is that arsenic, just from eating a lot of fish or from... Yeah, fish. Okay. You know, the arsenic came from basically plants that were absorbing it. For example, rice is a super common uh, uh, source of arsenic because okay. of the way it's grown in certain soils in certain states. So, you know, it, that's just stuff like when I actually detox my levels, it was like I had a profound like more than 60, 70% reduction in, in my heavy metals. I felt great. My, my energy levels felt higher. My clarity felt better. So it's like, these are things that, again, it's back to the subtleties. You know, it, everyone knows we should probably do detoxing. We just don't do it because if we don't believe it, it's again, it's one thing to know it. It's one thing to believe it. And then after you believe it, it's one thing to do it. What is the protocol for heavy metal detoxing? What does it look like? So there's several ways you can do it. There's a lot of great like oral supplementation programs out there. Um, most of them, I think the good ones take three to six months. I did a three monther. I'm now doing like a four, six monther one because I just felt so good. And so it just uses a combination of pills. And there's like so many, like I actually have to take more than like 10 a day. And it, it, and it varies every month. But the, the gist of it is this. It takes time to pull the heavy metals out of your tissue. So a lot of people have heard about IV chelation. I'm not really the biggest fan on that because it's too much, too fast, too soon, and you don't really pull it out. I feel it's like more of a superficial detox. Whereas if you actually go deeper into the tissue and you actually then pull it out of the tissue, have it secreted out in the bile duct, bind it, it's a process, right? So it's like you're prepping for a marathon. I always say like real heavy metal detox is like preparing for a marathon, Versus IV chelation is just more of an Olympic sprint, right? I mean, they're both beneficial, but I, from my personal experience and also from what I've seen with my clients, they get really good benefits if you do it low and slow. And I'm noticing that's a common thread in our conversation, right? Sustainability yep. over the quick fix. Yep. You know, and how we're really changing ourselves for the long term and not just looking for the next thing that might fix us quick or be the silver bullet undoubtedly in longevity with NAD plus with peptides, with stem cells, exosomes, um, there are a lot of tools that are becoming available and they, I think are tertiary compared to these fundamentals that we can continue to come back to mm -hmm. around sleep, diet, exercise, yep. relationships, even sunlight, right. Um, uh, sex, right. All of these sort of fundamental human things, uh, the, uh, the, the stem cells, the exosomes, the NAD plus great add ons, but they shouldn't be necessarily the, the central, just like supplements shouldn't be the central yeah. thing. Right. It's all, it's all part of the program. You know, I, I have a saying though, so it's gotta be practical. It's gotta be effective. You have to build a program around it. And when you start thinking of these three things, something I also like to always say, it's like the answers are in the questions. And so what we need to then ask ourselves are better questions. What are some things that actually then produce the energy we're looking for, create the clarity that we need? And so when you actually start circling around that, it, it comes again back to the nuance. You know, if sleep's the most important thing, what do I need to do about sleep? And giving the answer of eight hours of sleep, well, that might not be it, right? It really comes down to, again, how do I get enough sleep that actually will then create more deep sleep? So now that we have a better question, we got a better answer. I need more deep sleep. The deep sleep is actually what my body needs to repair my hormone levels, decrease my inflammation in my brain. So a couple of days ago, I interviewed Aubrey de Grey, who mm -hmm. is a scientist and researcher um, who looks a lot at, initially, I think it was mitochondria and free radicals. And now he's getting and has been pretty deep into medical rejuvenation therapies. And he coined this term, longevity escape velocity. Mm -hmm. um, you're familiar with... Yeah. He has like the SENS Institute that he, yeah. Right. So, you know, we haven't gotten that deep into this, com into it in this conversation yet, but I want to like start to open this up. You know, when we think about longevity, right, when we think about living longer, sometimes the question is, will we be able to live forever? You know, I mentioned the word immortal with Aubrey and he's like, I hate that word. I don't ever use it. Mm -hmm. You know, like irrelevant. I interviewed Christian Angermeyer. Uh, a few months ago, and we were also talking about uh, longevity and living longer. And he made the point, it's not a matter of not dying. It's a matter of choosing when you get to die. And he thinks, just like Aubrey does, that maybe in the next 10 to 15 years, that we'll sort of cross that path and be able to live lo longer and longer. Mm -hmm. What are your general thoughts about longevity, lifespan, um, do you think that will become more accessible, more available, more possible in the next 10 to 15 years? Or do you think 
this is just another sort of iteration of you know the human uh, pursuit of the philosopher's stone, which has proved to be fruitless for the last you know thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand years. You know, a term that's very popular these days is health span, and so health span basically means the number of years you have quality health. So unlike lifespan, lifespan is the duration of your years. Health span is the number of quality years, and I'm a very big fan of quality over quantity. You know, do we need people to be living to 150, 200 years old? I mean, that's again a philosophical question on how long you want to be on this earth. But I would say universally, most people would agree you would probably want to spend a majority, if not all, of your years in good health, and then towards the end of your life, it's more of a rapid decline. You know, because I think what we see now in the nursing home setting, it's actually quite sad. There's a lot of lifespan, but not health span. So there's a lot of chronic suffering. So from my perspective, I think, can we extend life? I think that's one aspect of, of, of the thing. Maybe you can extend the life, but the quality of it's not that good. I think what's going to happen is the quality of life is going to increase, right? Because it's going to be, if someone's working out, eating right, they're doing all these things that might be cellular help, cellularly helpful or reju- you know, rejuvenating certain aspects of their mitochondria, I think that's going to definitely lead to some longer life. But I think the idea of like having more disease and problems that are chronic will be less. And so maybe on the philosophical level of this, the real problem of living to 200 years old is, do we have enough resources for it? Does the person who even lives to that long, you know, is he going to be working when he's 102 to sustain his lifestyle when he's 180? These are like, again, fundamental things that I think will become more of a problem. So I think when you think about health span, something that's at least a real more direct correlation is that the more someone spends their life in healthy health span, the less of a burden they are, let's say, in terms of financial resources, right? Because if you're 80 and you have disease from 20 for 20 years, most of the healthcare dollars are spent towards that end of life care. Exactly. And so you kind of don't want people to live into 200. And of the two of the 200 years, 40 of those years were like chronic medical care, right? debilitated and things like that. Again, this is all postulating, you know, but I would say that's just sort of exaggerating out like what the possible scenario will be. Um, I would hope that what we focus on is more health span. You know, I like the idea of living longer as long as it's quality, right? And as long as there's enough resources to sustain that. I read a book recently about this sort of fear of dying that we have in, in, in Western culture. And so it talked a lot about, uh, it's written by this guy, Stephen Jenkinson, who spent a long time in nursing homes and elderly care. And so the book is all about how much people are scared of sort of crossing the other side. And so what's interesting about uh, psychedelics is they often, especially, you know, with the clinical research coming out of places like NYU for end of life anxiety, these high dose psilocybin experiences allow people to relax a little bit more into it and not try to extend lifespan, even if the health during that time is is awful, right? And so I think there is this sense of no matter where it plays out, whether it's how do we extend lifespan to 200 or how do we just help people towards the end of life accept the inevitable, it feels like there is this recurrent thing of um, wanting to live longer without really paying a lot of attention to mm-hmm. the quality of health, as you've mm-hmm. mentioned. And so I think the the sort of the, the ultimate is, as we were talking about, how could we have the health and vitality of our 20s, mm-hmm. potentially till we're 150, 170, 200. And so I'm curious from your perspective, what, what advances from a scientific perspective have made this possible? Uh, whereas it wasn't possible... 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago. Why now? Why science? Why are we now having this conversation about living till 200 in a very legitimate and possible way? I think it comes down to testing and having the right set of data. You know, we didn't really have the type of tests we do now, even like 10 years ago, when functional medicine, like let's say a gut microbiome test, it was pretty limited. Like, you know, you didn't really know how to interpret the results or there wasn't enough of a sample size to like really make a lot of, well, to some aspects, good interpretation data. So I think the fact that there's more data, more testing available, that makes a big difference. The fact that there are more therapeutics now that you can actually use to treat certain things, like increase your mitochondria function, improve sleep, I think those are all things that allow us to actually search for that innovation. I think I think with technology really 
advancing as fast as it has, that's probably why this pursuit is now possible. Like anything, right? It's like, look at space travel and electric cars. It wasn't like electric cars were a new thing, right? But then Tesla kind of really changed the game, right? They like said, hey, we're going to make it a really amazing experience. The battery is ultra long life. The car has a very nice digital interface. And that really made a difference in terms of like, hey, people enjoy Teslas over other EVs. I'm sure other EVs are really great too, but I think Tesla did make a name for themselves in that. Do you drive a Tesla? Uh, no, I don't drive a Tesla, but I, when I do, do you drive, drive an Audi, <laughs> no, I, you know, I have, a uh, one of my past cars with a BMW and then I have a, a gas guzzler Land Rover, but, um, oh, nice. right. you know, right. but Land Rovers I, are great. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I, I wouldn't mind an electric version of that yeah. if they put a Tesla They're coming out. I just, I was at a conference last week. There'll be a Mercedes Benz sprinter van. That's electric. Oh, I see. I would like wow. that. Right. Yeah. I, I did. I did pre-order a Tesla truck. I, I would. I did. Oh, I, do, I do want the, the cyber truck. I do want a cyber truck. That's cool. That's very cool. I've had a Tesla for the last few years. It's fast as yeah. hell, and it's fun to drive. It's a fun experience. You know, I, I, I think it all comes down to user experience. You know, at the end of the day, and maybe that's why we all want to live longer. We all want to have better experiences, right? Yeah, more rich experiences, mm -hmm. and and it is a very life affirming thing, right? A lot of us who are in this longevity conversation, in the psychedelic conversation, we enjoy life to such a degree most of the time there are periods yeah. of stress and difficulty but most of the time that we're like how do we continue to play in this way and explore it because um it just is what we know and what we right. love and how we want to be around you know I, I think the community is a big component of it right mm. so when you think about living longer you know i think what happened in the fitness community is massive you know I would say, let's go back to 2010, right? Quite a bit ago. It's no fitness community back then is nowhere it is now, right? Everything's, you have so many new organizations that popped up and like things that became popular, like Spartan and all that and those type of races. And so when you think about what longevity is doing now, it's like the, pre the preventative medicine thing never became a community. No one's like, hey guys, I'm in the not smoking club and don't drink club. Like right. it's just, because like really, even when we're taught preventative medicine in, in medical school, or if you're going through residency, it's like, okay, healthy diet, uh, don't drink or drink certain amount and no smoking. Like it becomes, it's literally a one line question in the medical history and physical. But beyond that, it's not, not much there. And so when you think about where, I mean, aging was only recently recognized as a disease by the World Health Organization mm -hmm. as of last year in 2022. Wow. So it took that long to say, hey, guys, we believe aging is a disease. Mm -hmm. So in my, so in, at least in my opinion, there should be a residency in that, a training, or some sort of fellowship program in that. Mm -hmm. Because really, aging is the absence of disease. And because medicine's not taught, what do you do in the absence of disease? There is no specialty for it. Right. The, the specialty of medicine is treating disease. And so I think that's why we have this community where it's about longevity, anti-aging, peak performance. And it does, it's very medical based, right? You're actually, you're working with people's physiology, but that's actually why I think it's really gone to more of a consumer front where people are empowering themselves. You have a lot of great technology that are very direct to consumer products. Exactly. Well, Dr. Holland, this has been uh informative it's been uh insightful super interesting i just appreciate you sitting down with us at the conference uh to share so much of your uh, thoughts and wisdom any final parting words on longevity functional medicine and health span yeah you know i really believe that longevity is a mindset so you know like i mentioned before we, we have some master class type of content if your audience wants to check it out, we'll go ahead and put something special for them. You know, they can they can always reach out to us on Instagram, uh, and we'll probably put some like links there. So if they if they're searching for that, or if you can put something in your show notes, we can put something in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. that'd be great. Yeah. You know, we I'm a really big believer of it because I you know again with the with the tie into psychedelics, you know I think everything starts at the nucleus of where your heart and mind are, mm. and so when you actually get into alignment with that, you, everything else that you do for your body then follows naturally in suit. It's getting back in touch with that deeper intuition. Correct. Right? And you know, balancing that with data that can help to yeah. create the structure necessary. Yeah. I think the, the good news about technology is it brings us very far in advance into things. The bad news about technology is that maybe it disconnects us far from ourselves. Right. And so I, what I hope to do is to teach people how to reconnect with themselves and use the power of their mind to help improve their physiology. I love it. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Of course. Thank you so much.
Hey listeners, Paul here. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Holland. Remember to follow the link in the show notes to dive deeper into this episode. You can subscribe or follow the podcast to get episodes like this each week. Leave us a review and continue on this journey with us. As always, thanks for listening. Until next time. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to grow your own medicine for microdosing or high dose experiences, check out our mushroom grow kit. It's the simplest way to get a reliable source of high quality mushrooms, and it includes detailed videos walking you through the entire process. No guessing, just clear instructions for best results. Check out the link in the description below.